presenter is Ray Watt. How to ep epidemiologically model a disease outbreak in space. So um, I just got off a plane from Ottawa, Canada, on the side of the continent, and uh, I haven't slept in a day, and I've had a crippling migraine for like five hours. So this is going to be fun. And uh, I just popped some drugs that will kick in in about like 15 minutes. I hope you know that happens. As a result, I've removed a lot of my slides to keep this as short as possible. So we'll get back on track as a result of me shortening all this. And uh, as the smile grows on my face, you know that the uh, medication's kicked in. Is that enough for all of us? <laughs> <laughs> talk to me. So, um, the last couple of presentations are so colorful, they're fantastic. I'm going to talk about a thought experiment on how to think about extraterrestrial diseases mathematically. And that's not fun. That's not colorful. I can't have pretty pictures and wear flight suits and things like that. Because math is not fun for anybody. And so I won't be talking about the math. I'll just talk about the assumptions that went into it. And obviously nobody knows what the truth is regarding extraterrestrial diseases. So all of this is just hypothetical anyway. And what I love about uh, the fact that this one of my students, Stefan Lipinjenko, he's a male model. And so I got a male model to do modeling epidemiologically. Nothing? Nothing? Okay. Tough crowd, tough crowd. <laughs> I got it, I got it. Thank you. So we had a couple of motivations for why, uh, why we wanted to do this, why we want to you know, uh, look epidemiologically at the possibility of extraterrestrial diseases. One frivolous reason and one real reason. The frivolous reason is the movie slash book Sphere. Anyone seen Sphere? It's a good movie. Great, fantastic. You know, it starts out with Dustin Hoffman is being flown to an aircraft carrier in the Pacific Ocean. He meets up with Sharon Stone, who's a biologist, and Samuel Jackson, who's a mathematician, and Vince Vaughn, who's a physicist, and, he's a, and Dustin Hoffman is a psychologist. And there's a, a spaceship has been found at the bottom of the ocean. And they're wondering, why'd you call us? And Justin often confesses, well, years ago, I wrote a paper saying, if we ever find a spaceship, you need a psychologist, a biologist, a physicist, a mathematician, and I named you guys because I knew you. So I figured, if we ever find extraterrestrial disease, I will have written my only papers on this, and they'll have to call me. So that's the real reason we're doing it. The other reason is, if this ends up being real, it's about time we start talking about it. And uh, I mean, people in this room, we're pretty confident and comfortable talking about things extraterrestrial, but the extent to which that bleeds into the public health domain is problematic. So it's important, I think, to start that conversation with public health officials such that if this ever happens, we are already on the ground with some kind of machinations. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, uh, we're publishing this as a chapter in a book published by uh, Robert Smith, who spells his name with the question mark. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a fairly famous statistician, and he's mostly famous for writing a book on uh, modeling zombie infections. So that's what we're dealing with here. We can't we take this that seriously, so the way we enter into the academic literature is to make a little bit fun of it, but it is a real deal. It's a real thing. And by the way, he, uh, he also modeled Bieber fever, Justin Bieber fever. He actually had a, a mathematical approach to that as well. So the guy gets it right. Um, as you know, most of us got our first exposure to the idea of an extraterrestrial pathogen from the movie slash book, The Andromeda Strain. And a lot of what's presented there might be realistic, given our assumptions and analysis. As well, a few years ago, Fred Hoyle, the famous astronomer, and Chandra Vikram Singh wrote a book called Diseases from Space, where they put forward the idea that, in fact, maybe they're already here. Maybe some of the pathogens and epidemics that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis here on Earth are the result of biologic entities falling from space into our biosphere. And this caused a bit of a kerfuffle. People obviously were not too pleased with it all. And it threatened Vikram Singh's career, which is why it's interesting to me that we reached a point where I can talk about this openly without my career being overt and threatened. That's how much we've evolved. A lot of this comes from the idea of panspermia. I'm assuming everybody in this room has heard of panspermia, right? As you know, it is the theory, the idea that life exists throughout the universe and through an interplanetary, interstellar transportation system, uh, cometary impact, meteorite impact, that sort of thing, materials are being shared between biospheres. Now, we only have one biosphere that we know of, that's on Earth, but there may exist other biospheres. And if life originated outside of this planet, maybe in its most basic forms, uh, advanced amino acids, that sort of thing, maybe through this interstellar slash interplanetary transportation network, other planets were seeded and other biospheres created. The 
If that's the case, then we can make some assumptions about the nature of life, not globally, but system-wide. There may be sufficient relationships such that there's compatibility between various biospheres. One of the, um, uh, the criticisms of the planetary protection program, of, of making sure that we have introducing microbes to Mars and things like that, is that, well, if a, a Martian biosphere exists, it would be so alien from Mars that our living tissues would not be compatible. But Pan's Pyramid tells us otherwise. It tells us that, in fact, if there is a common source of life, then there probably is some compatibility. So this is a serious deal. If it is true, then life beyond Earth will be at least in some way similar. Not completely similar, but in some way similar. And any alien life form arising from the same source will, to some degree, find a home here. Conversely, anything from here might be able to interact biologically with something originating Elsewhere. That's the fundamental assumption, and it seems reasonable to me. As I mentioned, several people have already suggested that we already have some extraterrestrial diseases here on Earth. It's been suggested that Spanish flu back in uh, 1913, 1918, was in fact of extraterrestrial origin. Fred Hall suggested that. Well, I don't think that's true. I think we have a pretty solid idea of where that came from. Um, SARS, Vikram Singh made international news when he suggested that SARS was in fact extraterrestrial. Again, it's a bit of a stretch. One of the criticisms of his position is that if something was extraterrestrial, his critics claim, it should have impacted the entire globe simultaneously, whereas SARS has a known starting point. And I know, that's a, a problematic assumption. I, I agree with your confused look there. Uh, some suggest that Ebola might be extraterrestrial, but you know, we, we kind of know where Ebola comes from as well, the Ebola Valley, and so forth. But then, has anyone heard of Pando, Pandora virus before? It was discovered about six years ago. It's this freaking enormous thing. It's about uh, 10 times bigger than an ordinary virus, and it shares only 6% of this genetic makeup with the rest of the biosphere. So what is it? Where did it come from? Is it something really ancient from the depths of the, human, of the terrestrial biosphere? Is it something that evolved recently? Or is it something that came from elsewhere? Who knows? This sort of thing makes the question rather intriguing. It's odd that it's only found in two places, the coast of Chile and a pond in Australia. So some people say that's evidence that it fell in those areas and found purchase in those areas, which is contrary to the criticism of Vikram Singh, saying if something was extraterrestrial, it should be falling all the time, all over the world. Who knows? We don't know. We have, we have zero data to go on this. So it's all uh, assumptions. Have you heard of pions? So prions are, to my mind, one of the scariest infectious agents. And I think it's important for this discussion because prions aren't alive. So suddenly, I can engage with public health officials in a meaningful way without having to introduce the idea of aliens. Things that aren't alive do fall from space all the time. And if they can engage with our biosphere, with living tissue, in a problematic way, that's a public health emergency. So prions are bits of protein that cause other bits of protein to denature. So no one knows how it works, but a prion enters your body and suddenly other proteins in your body start to denature. Mad cow disease is a famous prion disease, uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, etc. They have no cure, they're terrifying, and they're not alive. Okay? So that's the sort of thing that conceivably could fall from space. It doesn't have to be alive. It doesn't have to be a panspermia element. It could simply be hunk of non-living tissue, non-living elements falling from space. So I kind of knew that uh, the time was right to start talking about this in the mainstream. When in 2003, The Lancet published a paper by Vikram Singh suggesting that, in fact, SARS was extraterrestrial. If you don't know, The Lancet is the leading medical journal in the world. And for The Lancet to take this seriously was a signal to me that maybe the world is ready to have this conversation. Now, it's unfortunate that the conversation began with this premise, which is a little ridiculous, but it got a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. We got um, uh, a lot of response articles, including uh, the arguments that if SARS really was extraterrestrial, it would happen everywhere, not just in a couple places. But it's, to me, the takeaway was, oh my god, uh, people are talking about this realistically. That brings me back to my second reason for doing this uh, thigh experiment, and that is to start the conversation. As you'll see, we've made a lot of assumptions 
And you can disagree with these assumptions, and you're probably right, because nobody knows. It's all hypothetical at this point. But I think it's important to start making assumptions. Why is it important? Because we make epidemiological models to plan public health responses. I'm an epidemiologist, what I do all the time. We do this so we can figure out our, our vaccination schedules, figure out how to allocate our resources appropriately, to figure out how to generate our communications platform. So it's the final. So we need critical public health interventions. We need information and some kind of meaningful way forward to at least predict the impact of diseases. When we're building a disease model, there's some things we like to assume. Uh, first is we need to know the basic reproductive number. That's the number of cases that an infection is likely to produce during the course of its outbreak. The second is the proportion of people in the population that are likely to get the disease, because not everybody will. Some people will have some kind of immunity to it. And third, the average age when the disease is contracted. Um, most diseases target either the extremely young or the extremely old. Very few are broad spectrum across all ages. And lastly, the average life expectancy of the population. Now, of that four, some of these you can't really guess at realistically without a sample of the disease itself. Only the last one, we know this right away. Look at the population. The other three, I just, there's no way. There's no way. So all of this going forward is such an extreme thought experiment, making assumptions about the nature of diseases that don't or uh, likely do not exist. Other assumptions. The population's age distribution is stationary. What does that mean? It means that the proportion of young people and old people is going to stay the same throughout the course of the epidemic. That's not true either. We make that assumption because it makes the math easier. It's not true because if the disease kills off all the young people, then a few years from now, there'll be uh, a skew towards all the population. The Spanish flu, for example, targeted young people primarily, which makes it a very distinct kind of influenza. Most influenzas attack the elderly, and the Spanish flu is different in that respect. So it's a problematic assumption, but it's there. And the second, the population mixes in a homogeneous map, meaning that um, we're still going to work, we're still you know, going to school, um, our behaviors have not changed as a result of the epidemic, which of course is not true. So keep that in mind, all of this is not entirely accurate. Okay. okay, as disease progresses, all of these assumptions become less and less applicable. Let's keep that in mind. So the population age distribution will be skewed, as I mentioned. Uh, people change their travel plans because, hey, there's a disease over there, you can't go. And, um, as a result, all of our models aren't really realistic, but they are meant to be useful. Keep that in mind. Models are meant to be useful, not true descriptors of reality. And the two kinds of models that we like to create in epidemiology, the first is stochastic and the second is deterministic. Boring master, I know, let's keep doing that. Stochastic models just tell us about the, the, the probability of certain outcomes. That's what you and I actually care about. If a disease shows up, what's the probability that this population will still be alive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the deterministic models are the kinds of models that we like to create for planning purposes. And the deterministic models tell us the proportions of people that transition from one state of the disease to the next state. And that's really what we focus our thought experiment on. The most common kind of deterministic model is what we call the SIR model. It looks like this. The S stands for the susceptible population. The I is the infected population, and the R is the recovered population. So uh, think of this as compartments. I know some of you are engineers. Um, compartmental theory is common engineering. Things flow from one reservoir to another reservoir uh, according to some sort of differential equation. So susceptible population is the people who are likely to get the disease. The infectious population are those who now have the disease, and the recovered are those who had it but no longer had it if indeed it is recoverable. We make the assumption that they are recoverable. So um, mathematically, we just make these compartments and we figure out the flow rates and we do some math. Um, really, what we want is the derivative of each of those terms to tell us the rate of flow from one compartment to the next. And here's a standard graph of the typical infectious disease modeled through the SIR. Think of this as the common cold in a daycare. So the common cold take all the kids are going to get sick because we're all sort of self-contained, we got poor immune systems. And um, number of infected kids increases, then decreases as they get better. 
and the number of susceptible population goes down as they get the disease, and the recovered population increases. That's what we typically see for infectious diseases. We can modify them as well. And this is where the goal of our thought experiment came in, is what modification is most appropriate for a likely extraterrestrial infection? I can't believe I'm saying that still, extraterrestrial infection. It feels like good saying it at last. Okay. First, the SIS model. That's the R has been replaced with S, meaning that even though you had the, the, the disease, you weren't made immune by it. That's interesting. If you think about um, if something really is foreign to our biosphere, would we have the capacity to develop an immunity to it? Or would we always be attacked by it? The next is the SI model. That's when you become infected and you remain infectious. So for most diseases, well, most for many diseases, once you become infected, you're infectious for a period, but then as the disease progresses through your body at different stages, and you are less likely to be infectious. Your infectious stage is down. But SI is pretty scary. That's what zombies are. That's a, that's a zombie model there, the SI model. And the SEI model. Although this is not exhaustive, there are lots of other models too. SEIR talks about E, which is those individuals who have been exposed but are not yet ill, you know, in a latency period. And that's a little scary, right? Because who knows which of us is a carrier? Now, carriers can be infectious or not, or they can be non-infectious, waiting to become infectious. In which case, the model gets even more complicated. So, if we can make certain assumptions around what an extraterrestrial pathogen would be like, then we can modify these points appropriately. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll skip through these pictures with me. This just shows what a, a high latency disease looks like versus a low latency disease. When you're modeling an alien, alien bug, it's important to think about the models of the mechanism of infectivity. First is direct contact. So if I touch you or a disease touches you, that's how you get infected. Um, STIs are like that. Second is through immunologic enhancement, meaning the disease will cause you to have an immune response, like an allergy, and that's be devastating as well. And lastly, it produces toxins. Now, it strikes us that an alien disease is less likely to produce toxins because that requires a more intimate association with the scripture of biology, if you were. Whereas, direct tissue invasion, why not? Uh, allergic reactions, why not? You have allergic reactions to things all the time. Modes of transmission include direct contact, that's again the STIs. Uh, second, fomite contact, that's like uh, when you touch a doorknob and you get infected because someone else had touched the doorknob before you and they left some of that disease there. And lastly, which is the most common, droplet contact. That's for diseases that are more comfortable in a wet environment and as we, as someone gets infected and they cough it up, the droplets are floating about in the air and you breathe in and you get infected that way. That's a common cold is like that, influenza is like that. So this is what we're mostly scared of because that's somehow that affects the human uh, fear centers more powerfully. But this is equally as scary to me. The important thing with droplet contact is it assumes that the disease is comfortable in that wet environment. Other things to consider include the incubation period, virulence, and pathogenicity. Okay, uh, pathogenicity, that's the de degree to which a disease actually kills its host. There is a theory that diseases, successful diseases in the biosphere here, are successful, meaning they're with us all the time, because they don't kill us easily. If they killed us, then they lose their host. They lose their ability to make more of themselves. So it's in their best interest to figure out an evolutionary solution to keep us sick without killing us. So high pathogenicity is almost a sign of incompatibility with the biosphere. So something with low pathogenicity is probably something that we're used to all the time. So it strikes us that an alien menace will likely have high pathogenicity. It's more likely to kill you, in other words. Okay? So the likely characteristics of an alien bug. If it's comet-bounded or meteor-bounded, it would not require a natural reservoir. A natural reservoir is where a disease retreats when it has no other hosts. For example, the Ebola natural reservoir is a uh, kind of mouse that lives in Ebola Valley. Right? The, the plague, black plague, the natural reservoir, we used to think it was the rat, it's not, it's some kind of tick-like thing. Right? That's where it goes when there's no humans to infect. 
But an SUS disease doesn't have a reservoir. Therefore, it it's, has a different infection model. Um, second, basic genetic incompatibility suggests a less than optimal ability to act virally. Okay? That suggests to us a long latency period that takes time to figure out what to do. Okay. Uh, I'm moving fast because running out of time. I thought it would be short because it's not short. Okay, this is an interesting one. So, uh, given that an alien pathogen would have evolved in a non Earth like environment with strange atmosphere and gravity, etc., we thought, well, maybe its ability to sustain itself outside of its, uh, outside of its own domain on the Earth would be limited. On the other hand, if it survived a lengthy journey on a comet or a meteor, it's likely hardened that possibility. So, we're not sure. The argument goes both ways. Right? Keep in mind that a cometary pathogen is more likely to be water reliant, and a meteoric pathogen is more likely to be embedded in rock and its gas. So that leads us again to the method of transmission, fomite versus droplet. In the final analysis, we figured, we reasoned that indirect transmission would, would be more, most likely. Right? So leaving things on a doorknob, that sort of thing. And we think, therefore, that the SEIS model is the most likely with E being the latency. And the latency is the big unknown here. How long is it going to be? Again, all these assumptions could be, could be wrong. Your assumption could be better than my assumption. We just don't know. We have no data. But the point about this exercise is to start the thinking process such that when it does happen, we have some sort of framework to progress on. Okay? So, our conclusion. Two points. First is that we think that an alien organism that exists could actually infiltrate our biosphere, and it could actually trigger an epidemic. The parameters of that, of that epidemic would be largely unknown, and lastly, we think this model, the SEIS model, is the best candidate for starting the modeling process. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Um, last slide. Done. Questions? <laughs> Some diseases do have that. that um, Does that make it a candidate for an alien invasion that has been here or co-evolved with us over some period of time? I will say that I haven't mentioned the possibility of non, non-human hosts and zoonotic diseases, which are even more scary. Yeah. yeah, I've been very sort of human focused here. So the most common, um, we are the most common large mammal on the planet, but we're not the most common uh, organism. So if you were an extraterrestrial uh, uh, agent of some kind, seeking purchase in this biosphere, I'm not sure we're the best candidate to infect. I think a bacterial host would be probably the best bet because there are a lot more bacteria. Suppose they just want to take over. You know, There's that too. <laughs> there is that too. So to answer your question directly, I don't think that's a strong argument for candida being a alien origin. Um, I would think it's more likely that if it had a high pathogenicity. Because right? candida, is, candida is kind of banal. Well, it's waiting for the right moment. That's true. That's, that's all that's possible. Yes, sir. Uh, what diseases that we now have would expand in the radiation environment of Mars? Oh, wow. I have no idea. That's a really good question. It, I mean, it's going to, I think the viral ones have a better chance rather than the bacterial ones, obviously. The prionic diseases, probably are fine. I mean, um, depending on the type of radiation, I guess. Uh, proteins, denature, and uh, in exposure to gamma. So if it's not gamma radiation, prions are probably fine. Uh, mind you, the prion diseases are looking for other proteins to denature. So if those complex proteins aren't pleasant, present, then I'm not sure how to reproduce. So uh, I'm talking circles here. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> but I think a simple virus would be the one that would be the most. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, if it came in on an asteroid or meteor, uh, why would it be all over the Earth instead of just one location? You know what? I, did, I agree with you. That is not a good argument. But that was one of the arguments in response to Griffin Singh's paper. I would think you'd be looking for something that was in one location. That's right. I think the author, when they wrote that paper, was assuming that Vikram Singh's argument was that it's falling all the time. In that case, we would have found life by now. 
Well, yes. <laughs> I, I agree. It was, a, it was a foolish argument to make, but it was published as a response to Vikram Singh. So there it is. Uh, I think it was around my time. Uh, my time. Uh, by the way, I love the fact that people had questions for me. When I talk about this outside of the space domain, people are horrified by the topic. So, <laughs> thank you very much.